Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is a special privilege to be here with this great audience. I've been asked to talk about technology adventures in democracy. The rise of democracy and the explosion of freedom has roots in technology. Without science and technology, and without scientists and technologists, there is no freedom, nor there is future. Can you imagine life 150 years ago without electricity, telecom? Must have been very boring. Technology has given us longevity, reduced infant mortality, great communication, energy source, and at the same time, technology has yet to solve the problems of poverty, environmental blunders, hunger. Some of us very strongly believe that the best brains in the world are busy solving problems of the rich who really don't have problems to solve. And as a result, problems of the poor really don't get the right kind of talent that it deserves. Technology offers great hope going forward. Not just IT, biotech, nanotech, alternate energy, genetics, exploring ocean, the list is very long. Technology has its own sort of divine life. To me, it is a great social leveler, second only to death. Technology is an entry point. It bring a, brings about generational change. It brings about diversity, comfort, beauty, and offers opportunity for employment, growth, prosperity. I have spent now 47 years working on technology, mainly ICT. I started in US when I was just about 23 years old, working on digital communications in 1965. And I have had very interesting journey. In the process, I learned that information technology brings about openness, accessibility, connectivity, networking, democratization, decentralization, and as a result, social transformation. I was convinced that IT could really play an important role in defining India. I had an opportunity to work with many people in India in early 80s to build telecom infrastructure. And then Rajiv Gandhi's political will was the key. We redefine the landscape by focusing on access as opposed to telephone density, rural telecom as opposed to urban, indigenous development as opposed to import of products. And we essentially then focused on building human resource. Then we had 2 million telephones for 750 million people. It used to take about 10 years to get a new phone connection. In just a very short span of 20, 25 years, today we have 900 million phones, and we are a nation of a connected billion. The key is, how do we think differently today? Knowing that we are a nation of a connected billion, what should we do that would really take advantage of this historic opportunity. We got to think differently in every aspect of what we do. Of all the technologies, I believe information and communication technology, especially internet, web, has changed everything. It has changed the way we entertain, educate, work, at home, in the offices, 
and it is going to have far-reaching implications on governance, social networks, just to give you an idea of education. Someone long time ago decided that it should take four years to get a degree. And the whole world today follows that. It is about time to begin to question the very foundation of the idea that it takes four years to get a degree. Teacher today spends most of his or her time delivering content and creating content. I don't need teacher to create content. Nor do I need teacher to deliver content. I really don't need a teacher. Then what's the role of the teacher? Teacher really needs to be a mentor. So when you look at these kinds of transformational changes, at very core of the idea of education, everything we do today falls apart. I've been saying a lot of my colleagues that almost everything we do today is essentially obsolete. How do I get birth certificate? How do I get land record? Why should I have a set of forms to fill to apply for admission in school? It is time to rethink through all of the processes. All of the things in governance, education, and everything is out for grab. India is on a journey now for the biggest tech adventure in the history. I'm going to describe to you some of the things we are planning to do. Some are known, some are not that known. You know, I take a lot of medication in the morning, and I get dried up. So you'll have to live with this little disturbance. I had two quadruple bypasses. I had cancer, so I take about 12 tablets in the morning. <clears throat> so today, we are trying to focus on technology as the key to India's development, like we did in 80s, telecom, IT, software, technology missions. So we have a series of programs, and I'm going to describe some of these to you. First, we set up a National Knowledge Commission seven years ago to look at the knowledge institutions and infrastructures India would need in the 21st century. We looked at access to knowledge, knowledge concepts, knowledge creation, knowledge applications, and knowledge services. We had 27 different topics, all of the subjects had sort of working groups, and we put together a big report, which is with the government. Some of it is being implemented, some of it is sort of delayed. But the fact is we have a blueprint for knowledge, because we recognize that if we have to grow at 9 to 10%, the biggest challenge is going to be skill, education, expertise, knowledge. As part of that, we are now building a national knowledge network to connect 1,500 nodes with 40 gigabit bandwidth to connect all our universities, all our libraries, all our R&D institutions to really improve collaboration. This is going to cost us about three or four billion dollars. The idea is to recognize that all research today is multidisciplinary, requires a great deal of collaboration, and is happening faster than ever before. This is already under work. We have 400 nodes connected. These networks are connected to US, Europe, Japan, and we are trying to increase connectivity to the rest of the world. Then we are connecting 250,000 panchayats to optical fiber, which is going to cost us about $6 billion. The idea is to take thick pipe all the way to panchayat to improve governance, public service, and develop applications that we have never seen before, and really take democracy and radicalize democracy. But this requires a series of platforms. So Nandan Nilakani is building UID platform. Similarly, we have GIS platform, headed by Dr. Kasturi Rangan. 
We are working on platforms for cybersecurity, applications, data centers, procurement, payment, and portals. When all of these platforms are built and the connectivity is available, then young talent will begin to learn to develop new applications and new ways of doing things. It will take its own time, but we believe it will bring about massive change. Change in the delivery of public services. Just to give you an idea, we have 32 million court cases pending. It takes 15 years to get justice in this country. And we believe through computerization we can reduce that time from 15 to 3. But we need to now computerize our courts. Technology is one piece of the puzzle. We need domain experts like judges and legal experts to work with us to really transform. Similarly, health. We cannot take the Western model from US, which is not scalable, not workable, not desirable, it's too expensive. Same in education. You can't pay $40,000 a year tuition to graduate one of our students. So we need Indian models of development in health, education, and many areas. So all of this network and technology that we are trying to put together at the cost of perhaps 100,000 crores doesn't mean much if we don't focus on innovation. Knowing this, President of India decided to declare 2010-2020 as the decade of innovation. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh set up a National Innovation Council, and we are really now trying to drive innovation. India has the history of innovation. We set up the best of the best universities 2,700 years ago. Lakshashila and Alanda. We had great examples of innovations in the past, including invention of zero. We were the world's largest economy in 1760. Unfortunately, after British Raj, we went from 27% of the global economy to 2%. And don't be surprised if India turns out to be the largest economy by 2060 again. So in the process of innovation, we are focused on getting 2,000 people to really champion this idea of innovation to change mindset. State level councils, sectorial councils, national councils. We are creating a billion dollar fund for bottom of the pyramid innovations. We have 150 clusters, diamond cluster, leather cluster, bamboo cluster, pharmaceutical cluster. At these clusters, we are trying to seed innovations. We are trying to make sure that our universities and our industries begin to talk. Because today, our scientists don't teach, and our teachers don't do very much research. So we need to bring all of this together. All of this is going to take a lot of time and effort. It is going to require change in mindset. It's not going to happen overnight. It is also not going to happen if you think glass is half full. I find a lot of people in this country very cynical, always looking at glass as half full. We all know that we have huge challenges. From my perspective, we really have three major challenges. I was talking to someone at a dinner last night, and I said, first one is disparity. Disparity between rich and poor, urban, rural, educated, uneducated. Second, demography. 550,000 per million young below age of 25. Everything we do today has to keep that in focus. It's their prosperity, their skill set, their jobs, their future which is at stake. This is the workforce for the world and not just for India. Three, development. Everything is happening in India but perhaps not happening fast enough. 
how do you expedite the process of development with innovations, knowledge, and focus on new technology, new possibilities, and new mindset. I am convinced that we are on the right track. Unfortunately, this the government does not get a lot of credit for all the good work that is going on, because nobody talks about it. In India, it's very easy to identify problems. You do not need talent to identify problems in India. You also perhaps don't need talent to find solutions in India. You really need courage, confidence, to go forward and get it done against all the odds. People talk about corruption a great deal. It is an issue. It is an issue all over the world. Do you really want to get hung up? Bureaucracy is an issue. Political system is an issue. It is part of this society. It is a reflection of all of us. Because the guy who is corrupt is also my cousin. Growing up, I know that teacher doesn't teach. My dad doesn't pay tax. My uncle cheats. That's the way life it is. What do you do? You got to get it done against all these odds. And that's where I think you need to go beyond petty complaints. You need to take issues at a time and focus on these issues with new mindset to begin to solve very complex problems. A lot of my friends in the US say, why do you keep on going to India? And I said, if you really want to solve the most complex problems in the world, India is the place. There aren't too many problems to solve in developing world, uh, in developed world. Everything seems to work. We have huge challenges for the bottom of the pyramid. We still have 400 million people who are below poverty line. We have 300 million illiterates. And it is not about market at the bottom of the pyramid. It is about earning capacity for them. We have so much talent in bottom of the pyramid. You look at our art and craft. I give you one example. I was told 20 years ago that we have 12,000 herbal medicinal plants which are unique to India. Doesn't grow anywhere else. And we decided to document those plants. Then Rajiv Gandhi government was in power, so we said we will set up a foundation. Immediately we lost elections. VP Singh government came in and nobody would give us money. Finally, I got $4 million from Danish government. Started a foundation in Bangalore. Today we have 200 people, and we have documented 11,000 of these plants. <laughs> Similarly, we have million Indian manuscripts digitized, documented, and we probably have close to 10 million more to work on. If you just look at our traditional knowledge and digitize, computerize, organize, make it available in modern form, itself is a lifetime of work. Leaving aside the new knowledge that we need to create to solve our problems. On one hand, as I said earlier, we have disparity, demography, and development as the challenge. On the other hand, we need to expand. Everywhere we need to expand. More homes, more colleges, more schools, more teachers, more doctors. We need to excel. The quality is pretty bad. And if we don't focus on quality, we will have a serious problem in our education, in our health services, in our roads, bridges, everywhere. And we also need to make sure that there is equity so that the poorest of the poor can indeed get the best education possible, can get the best health, health service possible. We believe it can be done. It is not either or. It is all of this and some more. <laughs> Finally, I know I have time limit, so I'll get it done in 
two more minutes. I was given 20 minutes. I'll try to finish it. I give you just one piece of the adventure, which is the adventure to democratize information. Adventure to make sure that everybody has equal access to information, knowledge, expertise. But we have so many other programs underway. Friend of mine, Dinesh Trivedi, is here. We are working on railway modernization, using new technology, IT, satellites, and you name it. We would probably need 800,000 crores to modernize railways. We are building our own semiconductor fab, which will take another $10 billion. We are working on smart grid. These are just few examples of technology interventions in India today. These are the real adventures that we are working on. Unfortunately, nobody knows. Because when I look at Indian TV, which is rare, I see three things. Bollywood, cricket, and political gossip. And I find very little interest in any of these. Nation building is very different from company building. Nation building requires a whole different kind of mindset. It requires a lot of patience, and you got to plant seeds. The seeds we are planting today are so very critical in the history of India. The seeds we planted in the 80s, I was lucky to be able to see the fruits of it. I know that the seeds we are planting today, I won't be around. Thank you.